so much for coming, and I appreciate being asked to tell you all about our Wilkinsburg train station because it was a monumental effort. But uh, so I'm going to start the program. Uh, we call it Wilkinsburg Train Station, restored and ready for the next century. But to know the story of our train station, we have to really start at the beginning with what we had before that. So we're going to let's see if I can. We're starting here with a map. This is a map of, from 1886. That is the year before Wilkinsburg was incorporated as a borough. Um, and uh, it, you see it says Main Street across the top. Well, Main Street later became Penn Avenue. It wasn't Penn Avenue in 1886. A lot of things changed when we became incorporated as a borough in 1887. But you see there's two dots here. This purple dot indicates where our first and second train stations were because that's where it was along the railroad tracks and that was where they built it. Um, the red dot indicates where the third and current train station was built. Um, but why did they build a train station two blocks away? What made them decide, let's build a train station? Um, that wouldn't be normal. So we'll start off with, this is the train station, the first train station that we had. This was built at where that purple dot was at the intersection of the train railroad tracks and Franklin Avenue. Um, this was built, the, our information says the 60s, but I kind of doubt that it was built in the 1860s since the train came through in the 1850s. I don't think they'd wait five or ten years, five or eight years to, to build a train station. So nevertheless, our records say it was built in the 60s and it burned down in 1883. So then what did they do? They, they built another train station. So that would have been up where the trestle is going over Washington Boulevard? No. Oh, no, no, no. This would all be within Wilkinsburg. And I thought you said Frankstown. No, did I miss? Franklin. Franklin Avenue. Franklin. I thought you said Frankstown. Oh, no. Franklin okay. Avenue, which is one of the parallel streets yeah. that runs along Penn, Ross, yeah. South, Franklin. So uh, anyway, when that one burned down in 1883, 1884 came, and they built this new train station. This was the second train station on that same location. Now you can see by now there's a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of buildings, a church steeple in the background. There was a lot going on in Wilkinsburg then, because by 18, um, 1884 they had been incorporated. Well, they hadn't been incorporated yet, but there was a lot a lot of people wanting to incorporate. So they were getting real real busy. A lot of businesses, a lot of homes, a lot of people moving in. But you can see in this picture, there's not a lot going on. There's one man over in the corner. There's one horse and buggy. There's no safety railings, but there weren't very many people milling around there. So it didn't seem to be, a, it seemed like a perfectly safe way to have a train station. So then here's the same view of the same train station on a much busier day. And you can see lots and lots of people all milling around the train station around the, where the you know, passengers would wait. You can see several horse and buggies there. It, there are no safety rails. There's also no, no flat platforms or, or wooden planks to make the travel across the tracks any easier. If you were walking across, you had a good chance of tripping. Um, you also uh, would be very, very difficult to bring a horse and buggy across there because there was nothing smooth to, to do that with. So um, not, needless to say, there were a lot of accidents because as people decided to dash across the tracks, to get safely to the other side to, for their home as they were traveling back and forth across the tracks to go to the shops or to where their home was or their church. Um, th that was not a safe place to do. So what did they do? They put in safety railings. If you look towards the middle of the picture, there are safety railings in place that would channel any, any passengers or people away from just crossing anywhere. You, had, you were kind of channeled into just where the crossings were. And there was wooden planks across there as well to make it safer and easier to travel across with a, a horse and buggy and with the brand new automobiles that were brand newly coming out and more people were starting to have those as well. But even with railings and safety and platforms with the wood, it was still a very dangerous thing to do. There was many, many news articles. I just read one today where 1907 there was a little boy crossing dashing across and he got hit by the train, cut off both of his legs. I mean, that was real common that you were injured mm -hmm. severely. Um, it, was very, it was a very dangerous place. Um, here's an aerial view of that same Rebecca Crossings, which was nicknamed the Bloody Crossings 
because there were so many people that died there and so many people that were injured there. And oftentimes there was newspaper articles about a wagon full of kindergartners that got hit by the train. Oh, people would, because oh. keeping in mind there were four layers of track there, two fast moving uh, freight trains and two slower moving commerce or uh, passenger trains. So there was a lot, of, a lot of activity there. And you might think you're safe to travel. You look in one direction, and then as you're dashing across, the other train comes. Because it was a noisy place. There was an awful lot of noise. So it's not like you could, if I don't hear a train, I can go. There was a lot going on there. So you could see from an aerial shot, it was still a very dangerous thing. And you can see there's still people strolling across. How fast can they go in those long dresses? And even, even though they had smoothed off the, the crossings, it was still very dangerous. And I think we have one more picture of that, that same area. You can see the, the, the safety railings are in the background there. And they have a watchman there that was guiding the people and letting you know when you could cross. But that didn't stop the, the danger. That didn't stop the accidents and, and all the people who are still being killed regularly. And in fact, there was, I just picked a few of the articles that we had had, you know, killed to, hurled to death by the train, Wilkinsburg boy killed at Homewood, um, that was at a different crossing, but all up and down there was lots of crossing accidents. Uh, the abolish the death traps, the jury's recommendation. Um, there was one incident in July of uh, 1911 where a serious train vehicle collision took four lives in one, in one incident. Four people from the Whitney Avenue Street were crossing in the automobile, got hit by the train. Four out of five died. And tell them that it divided Wilkinsburg. The railroad tracks cut off a very popular yeah. area. The, yeah, the railroad tracks went across <coughs> right through the middle of Wilkinsburg. So, so a lot of people who lived on one side wanted to shop on the other. A lot of people who wanted to go to church. In fact, just today I was at, I was at South Avenue United Methodist, and they were the mother church to quite a few other Methodist churches, but one of them was specifically built on the other side of the tracks so that none of their parishioners would die trying to get to church because there had been accidents where people just coming to church or going home from church were killed. But um, the angry and heartbroken residents petitioned Borough Council at that point to work with the Pennsylvania Railroad to eliminate those dangerous crossings. The solution was to raise the railroad tracks and lower the adjoining roads or you know, the streets, and to build a new tra train station a couple of blocks away so that that would be out of the business district. So that's why that little red dot there was two blocks away, because the business district had shops and stores in it. It didn't have room for, for the expansive new train station that we needed. So they got, a, got a, a, an architect on board, and this was the proposed new train station, uh, which was what, exactly what we ended up with. Um, it was uh, designed by a, a, an architect from, named Walter Cookson from Philadelphia, and that was the design that they decided to go with. And of course, the, pro the plan was to lower the roads and raise the railroad tracks, but lowering the roads means digging out massive amounts of dirt. So that's what they had to start doing. So this is looking down from Wilkinsburg, the main business district, looking down towards, towards the railroad. At this view, they had already raised the railroad tracks down here, and they were lowering Penn Avenue. Now, they didn't lower Penn Avenue all over the place, just from Wood Street down, tapering it down as, as it neared the railroad to, make, to be able to make it. Uh, they needed to get at least a 14 or 15 foot clearance, I think. But they had to lower the, lower the roads by digging out the dirt and raising the tracks because you couldn't just do one, you had to do both in order to make it a, a nice smooth transition. And they couldn't raise the, the tracks that fast coming out of Homewood yeah. because they, it was too much of a grade for the locomotives to handle. So they had to, raise, they had to lower the roads to make, you know, keep the trains running right. So here's that same view except turned around looking back up Penn Avenue. Now up here is where Wood Street would be crossing at Penn Avenue. And that part wasn't touched because you didn't, you didn't need to lower them way up by, up by Wood Street. It was as you tapered down towards the, towards the railroad tracks that you needed to do that. But you can see the men in the trenches. When I look at this, I see a little boy in knickers standing here, and, and these guys digging in these trenches that are not supported. 
all kinds of OSHA violations if that was today. Couldn't do that today. Couldn't do that today, but there was a massive amount of, of dirt was moved and relocated. But Please note the people so, in white shirts. Yeah. Hmm? White shirts and bowler hats. Yeah. yeah. So that was the lowering of, of Penn Avenue. And then we move on to, here's another place where, where they had the, the surveyors measured the correct depth because everything was carefully measured to see how far it needed to go so that it matched up with the next property down. And his shoulder level was the former sidewalk. And after they dug down, for this particular section, of this was on Franklin Avenue, you could see that the new sidewalk level would be down by his feet. So, and of course, as you got closer to the railroad tracks, that might have been 10 feet. In this case, it was more like five feet, you know, where this particular house was. Of course, that cut off the people who had indoor plumbing, which not, wasn't everybody at that time, and indoor and, and electricity, it cut that all off. So many people had to move. Many people, if they were still able to stay in their home, they had to have ladders or steps provided by the borough so they could access their front door. Because suddenly, you're, you, can, you can't get to your house if it's, if it's um, no, no way to get in there. This is a view of Wood Street, which is the main, one of the main business districts off of Penn Avenue um, at that time. And it's, it's to get a sense of, because the next picture will show this same view. They dug down, and of course the trolley came down here. And trolley was a main way of transportation at that time. So they had to remove those tracks and lower them down and reinstall the trolley tracks so that those people could still get to work and wherever they needed to be. Now if you see, see this is still the horse and buggy era. This, was, this picture would have been taken about 1914 or so. But you can see they were getting ready to lower that. And here's that same view. If you see this sign that says Baker, then you can see the next view. There's that, they lowered that, dug all that out, moved those trolley tracks way down low, provided steps so that the people who were using the trolleys would be able to go down and get on the trolley and go about their business. But all of these sidewalks had to be shored up. They all had to be supported, because otherwise they would be darn dangerous to have anybody be able to step on those sidewalks and have that collapse. They had certainly an awful lot, an awful lot going on. So um, the shops were trying to stay in business, so the, the borough wanted to make sure that they didn't stop any access for people who wanted to be customers of, of these bakery shops, jewelry shops, floral shops, all the different shops that might have been there. So. They were trying to stay in business despite all this excavation and the mud and the mess and the inconvenience and disruption of traffic. But everybody felt that it was still the best thing to avoid the death traps on, at, those, at those railroad crossings. So then we go on to, this is, this is looking up Penn Avenue towards Wilkinsburg. This is the underpass that looks just like that today. A little worse for the wear, but nevertheless. They were, just about, they were done with the raising of the tracks here and they were almost finished with getting the road ready. Here's the pile of bricks so that they could re-brick the street. And over here on top of the railroad tracks, you see the men with wheelbarrows. It's a little tiny for you to see now, but, and they're dumping the, the limestone, crushed limestone as ballast along the railroad tracks. But this is, you know, as they're moving right along, this would have been about 1915, because the, the train station was finished in 19, or actually it was finished in April of 1916, and the grand opening was June of 1916. So they were, they were getting done. So then we move on to new passenger station opened in Wilkinsburg. Pennsylvania Railroad Company spends about $3 million in improvements. So keeping in mind, that's, that's a lot of money, especially 105 years ago. That was a lot of money. Um, this was opened. It was called, the, it was a bow art uh, design, which is a, a grand scale. You know, with rich ornamentation, symmetry, classical forms, large columns. And in this article, they stated, um, the local railroad officials declare that the new station is the finest of its kind between here and Philadelphia. It is granite, limestone, and tap shield brick in construction, finished in vitrified brick and marble trimmings. The building faces 103 feet on Hay Street. An illuminated clock on the east front can be seen for several squares. Level with the floors are elevated concrete platforms. The coach platforms of the train stop even with the station platforms, eliminating the necessity of climbing steps to board the carrier. The, st the section platforms are roofed. 
They extend for more than 1,000 feet between the South and Penn Avenue. Altogether, the improvements of which the new station is part cost the railroad about $3 million. Five grade crossings were eliminated at a cost of approximately $600,000 apiece. So with all that done, the new train station, and that was our brand new beautiful train station in 1916. You can see the platform, can't you, the track platform? Yeah, yeah there's another slide that shows that. So, so this was our beautiful new train station. I've got to tell you, this, this is a postcard I bought. I saw it on eBay, and, and I've bought postcards before, and they might be $5 or $8. This one was $35, and I debated whether I should spend the $35 on that postcard, and I'm so glad I did, because I thought there would be other pictures of the new, new train station, but there weren't any. I've looked high and low through our records, and there wasn't any, so my, my $35 was well spent. This is another view of the train, it's another postcard that I bought, showing the train station with those, with those platforms. And the, you know, they were cut, they, part of it was uncovered, part of it was glass enclosed towards the back, and the train tracks were down below the concrete section there. So um, those were one of the, they had three of those elevated uh, passenger waiting platforms. But you can see they, they had pennants, there was a lot of celebration. This is the, the, one of the pennants they had, June 8th, 7th, or no, 8th, 9th, and 10th. 1916, a three-day celebration because everybody in Wilkinsburg wanted to participate in the grand celebration of getting rid of the mud and the mess and the inconvenience of travel and inconvenience of their homes and having a safe, safe crossings and to be able to access this beautiful new train station. And the pennant says, celebration, elimination of grade crossings and borough improvements. So they did put in some new sewage pipes while they were digging up the roads. There was a lot of additional things that were done while they were doing all the, all the digging. But the main, thing, the main thing was getting rid of those railroad grade crossings and opening the beautiful new train station. Putting a lot. So um, these were these monumental pew type benches. They had high backs on them so that as you're sitting back to back with somebody on the seat that adjoined your seat, you could have conversations that they couldn't hear. So you could have private conversations because they were high enough that you couldn't overhear somebody. But that's, we have very few pictures of what it looked like when there was actual uh, benches in there. And here's a picture of those, of those raised platforms. Um, and actually, I, I, I questioned it and I, I heard, I've never seen them because these platforms were long gone when I came on the scene. But these, uh, this is the railroad tracks. And these were the, plat the elevated concrete platforms that would be level with the, with the, with the train. However, uh, somebody said, well, actually, what, because of the, the, there were steps to go up into the train. So, and this would be flat with that. So, except there was, would be a hollow. So apparently there was some sort of a, of a trap door that, they would, that the train people would raise and put in place so that you could get in. I don't quite get how that worked, but I'll have to investigate that. Now, the, the train doors would have opened level with the uh, with the platforms. They would, and, and there they, wouldn't have the, the, the train. The cars do have steps that they can fold down that would go to street maybe level. Maybe that's what they had. And when they when you don't have a, a raised platform, but otherwise they wouldn't have lowered those. You would have stepped directly that, into the train. But that car. was the idea that you didn't have to climb up and down right. the steps to get into the train. So then here we come into the 40s, and uh, oh, what did I want to tell you about this? Well, the cars are bright and shiny. Those would be. Tra um, cabs that you could take uh, to get in and out of the area. But you can see that the train uh, station itself has acquired that, that typical ubiquitous soot-covered uh, exterior that was typical of almost all of the buildings that were made out of light brick or, or stand, sandstone in that era. Everything got covered with that awful soot. So the train station was no, no exception. Um, here's a picture that shows actually what the train station looked like in 1962. And we know that was 62 because that was the 75th anniversary of Wilkinsburg's incorporation. That was a big deal. Wilkinsburg was incorporated on in October 5th of, of 1887. So in 1962, that was the 75th anniversary. They made a big deal. And the train station was the headquarters for all the festivities that they had during, again, a three-day celebration. Wilkinsburg was big on three-day celebrations, but their 75th anniversary was a big one with parades and such. But uh, 
So it was, again, the centerpiece of Wilkinsburg. It was always, always an important building for Wilkinsburg. Um, however, at this point, this was in 1962, and just three years later, in 1965, passenger service to Wilkinsburg through the railroad was discontinued. Two other things about this picture, you can see all the ivy encroaching from the right side of the building. Actually, that's the, the north side of the building. But, and um, I don't know why people think that ivy looked good, but it didn't. And it didn't prevent, prevent it from getting soot covered either. The other thing you might notice is that the clock, the illuminated clock, doesn't look like it's there. Well, it was there all right, but every so often the mechanism wasn't working right. And so when it wasn't working right, you can't have a big giant clock that can be seen for two squares telling people what time it is, and they're basing their time to leave or their time to go run and catch that, that train based on incorrect information. So when they knew that the train wasn't, the, that the clock was not working properly and it was getting incorrect time, that's when the Pennsylvania Railroad placard was affixed to that front face of the clock so that people would not be misled on what time they should uh, catch the train. And this was another picture, and this was in 1965. Passenger service was discontinued, and the ivy was covering the whole building. So then we go 50 years later. This one was taken in 2015. And by then, the place had been abandoned. Amtrak had tried briefly back in the 70s to have train service and part of the 80s, uh, and they discontinued that because the first six months that they tried having some passenger service through Amtrak, they had 120 passenger, 128, I think, passengers the whole, whole first six months of, okay. of the year. That was not financially feasible to continue that, so it was, became vacant, abandoned, with no particular use. Lots of ideas came up, ideas of what they could do, they were thinking, well, maybe what we need to do is have, um, oh, it was going to be an antique store, then it was going to be a glass blowing studio. Then somebody said, well, maybe it could be a food emporium um, that was going to be a museum. They also thought of moving the, tr the post office over to that building. Uh, they thought of moving the library there. They, uh, the only thing that actually did happen was they made it into a haunted house around Halloween every year. <laughs> For several years, it, was, and it made a darn good ha haunted house. But, I remember um, in the early 60s, they had commuter service on that line. Yes. To go from downtown up to East Pittsburgh, because I knew somebody that was an engineer out at Westinghouse. He'd ride from the Shady Side Station, he'd get his train every morning, go out to East Pittsburgh, and I guess it went through, of it course, it went did. through Wilkinsburg. In, that, it was like that, a bus service. But. It certainly did, and the, and the train stopped, like it would start, I mean, it would go like Braddock and Swissville and Edgewood and Wilkinsburg, times, Homewood, yeah. I had to go get my dad so I could use the car. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was part of my chores. But you can see that the ivy was encroaching. There it weren't didn't, enough it didn't customers. Yeah. It was boarded up, the glass had been broken, it was vandalized. Yeah, On the was. outside you can see that the, uh, the side and the back was all covered with the ivy and the Virginia creeper. And that was on the outside. So now we go to the inside, it looked pretty awful. That's uh, part of the inside. The weather incursion and the vandalism caused just massive damage. There's another view of the inside of how awful it looked. And another view, there was just so much damage, so much. The water came in, the snow came in, um, rodents came in. It was just terrible. Uh, some more of the, the vandalism was just unbelievable. Um, I honestly, as often as I went in there, which is about once a year, the county would come, at one point the county owned the building, and they would come once a year and snap off the, the padlock, would let a few of us in to see how bad it had gotten, and there was always way more damage than there had been the year before, and it looked absolutely hopeless. So then, what happened? The Wilkinsburg Community Development Corporation came to the rescue because they decided that this was a building worth saving. It had been on the Preservation Pittsburgh's and the Young Preservation's top 10 list of places to restore or preserve or at least hang on to, uh, although there was no idea how on earth you take something in this awful condition and, and restore it. But they chose that project as a priority. So the WCDC, the Wilkinsburg Community Development Corporation, they worked really hard to secure loans and grants and donations. And they were kind of looking and putting in applications here and there. And they got rejected initially by the Richard King Mellon Foundation. And then they got the word that actually Richard King Mellon Foundation was going to give them $1 million. 
it was amazing. It was a gift. However, it was a gift with, with strings. And the idea was, yes, you may have a million dollars, but you must prove to us, you must prove to us that the community cares about this, that the community is also invested in this, that the community and other stakeholders in the area want to help contribute towards this. They need to put their money where their mouth is. So it wasn't just, here's the money, go do what you want to with it. It was, show us. So the community development group worked very hard to contact Wilkinsburg alumni, residents, business owners, organizations, foundations, all kinds of people, including our historical society. And we had been selling our Arcadia book, and we gave them the bulk of everything we had in our, in our coffers to show them that, yes, we care. We've been talking about this for almost 50 years. So we wanted to make sure they knew, yes, we're in on this. And I personally dug a little deeper into my pocket than I normally do for just projects and things that I care about because I, I really wanted to see something happen. And this looked like the first actual real chance of having something happen. So then we, uh, so moving along here. So this is actually the ivy in the fall. It looked rather pretty, turned bright red. So we have this bright red ivy but it covered up the building. So the first thing you need to do when you have a building like this is see what happens. So they took all the ivy off and restored, started working the outside. And that's what that looks like without all the coverage and the vegetation. This was a, a more recent picture when everything had been restored and windows replaced, but nevertheless, you get the idea. This is that passenger tunnel that went back towards the steps that went down under to get to the, the passenger platforms. Broken out windows, covered with ivy, looked pretty awful. And that's what it looks like today. And then we have, underneath the, the ivy was a plaque. Couldn't read what it said, but there was a plaque under there. Once the vegetation came off, we saw a historic landmark. There was a landmark plaque there. And this was from the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks, indicating that the architect was Walter Cookson, that it was built in 1916. Um, and it was just, we're discovering things. This was when in 2018 when they put up a scaffolding with five layers of uh, levels of, of scaffolding to be able to access the brick and the mortar to work on all that. Here's a side view showing the, the same scaffolding, but just, again, they had to access every bit of that. There was nothing that could just be left alone because you had to check out the integrity of, of everything if you're doing a, what ended up being a multi-million dollar uh, renovation or restoration. This was historic restoration. This was not renovation. Um, as you see from this drone shot, the roof had very little left of it. Um, there was a little section in the middle that was still somewhat intact. The rest of it was, was shot. So, of course, the rain and snow and everything else came in. Massive amounts of water were in that building. So That building was flawed. It had eternal drains for the roof. And well, as soon as they plugged up, the roof took the water. And it seeped in, and then the roof broke down. So it was built flawed. Well, but nevertheless, it, it didn't receive any of the maintenance that it needed. Here they are with, the, with again, some additional materials to, to get up there and get on working on that scaffolding. Um, so we have the roof mostly missing. But nevertheless, once they put a new roof on, it took a full six months before anything could be done inside because they, you had to let the building dry out. Everything was saturated. It, it almost was, water was ponding inside there. It was several inches deep inside there. Um, and then, let's see, we have the people that really, that really made the most memorable parts to look at now. This, is, this was Neil Marenberg from Marsa, which is a, a, a marble company. And he's with another member of the Marsa crew. And they are brick and marble specialists. And they would get, they get their, and their mantra was restore when possible, replace when necessary. And Neil and his team cleaned and polished all of the marble that was in there. They had to remove all the pieces, clean and polish them, and reattach them. Um, they got replacement parts of the cream-colored uh, Botticino marble, the white Carrera marble, and the Tino's green marble, all ordered from Italy actually from the same quarry that the original marble had come from. Um, they were taking out some of these marble pieces outside to clean and polish them. All of the pieces had to come off because the way they had originally been hung was with steel rods. Let me show you something. He showed me, I took this picture when he was explaining how they, they, the method of hanging the marble was to have rods. They had steel rods that were glued into place
facing of the, of the, uh, on the inside to the brick uh, substructure. However, they didn't expect that so much water would be coming in and rusting out those pieces of, those pieces of, of, uh, of steel wire, a steel rod. So they switched to copper, and of course now we have, we have epoxy materials that are far superior. But they, had to, they couldn't leave some of those up and some not because that's what was the problem. The marble was falling off the wall as these pieces of steel had broken. So let's see, then, then we go to, um, uh, this is a new shipment of the marble moldings for the pilasters because around the perimeter of the inside there were pilasters which are like the flat columns that would go around the inside of the building. The bottom ones were pretty much in good shape because they didn't fall off. The top ones had all fallen off and, they had, and broken and so they had to order new ones to put at the top after they had put new pieces of marble on. In this picture you can see, like here's some of those pilasters along the, along the perimeter and they had to take each piece off and marble of course is so heavy they had to start from the bottom and work up and put, put a piece on then the next piece on top of that and then above that so that things wouldn't just, you can't just start at the top and work down, you have to start at the bottom and work up. But uh, nevertheless, these, um, these pieces were heavy and they were installed. Each piece was taken off and cleaned, polished, and reinstalled. And then, let's see, this is, um, you can see there was an awful lot going on at, at one point. This is the daylight coming in here. They had a few light, lights strung in the ceiling to be able to, to see what they were doing. But there was a lot going on at once. There was marble, brick, electric, windows, plaster, terrazzo, plumbing, because they, there's bathrooms in there now. Plumbing also for the future kitchen for whoever rents that place when, the, you know, leases the, the, the train station. But they were all working together, but they all had to not get in each other's way as they were doing this. And as you can see, there was no plaster ceiling. Here's another view of the work that they were doing. And again, uh, you can see that the plaster was gone. There was, no, there was no plaster remaining, no cornices, no dental molding, nothing. Here is a view of um, the, the brick and the marble being cleaned. They started from this left on this section. You can see the difference in the, the clean version versus the filthy version. It, it was just a tremendous amount of coordination of the cleaning people and the, and the marble people and the plaster people. And when they're finished, you can see this is way up at the ceiling. And these are very tall ceilings. I can't recall exactly how high they are. But a, a piece of marble like this, this is eight feet long. This is not a short piece with details. And you can see from this aerial shot sh showing from the, at the top of the scaffolding. Again, the, the people that were going to do the plaster work around the perimeter had to start and just work the way around the room. So who does that? Ta-da! The Plaster Heroes. This is an 84-year-old man named Harry Stites and his son and his grandson. Thankfully, the skills that this man has are being passed down to next generation because the kind of work he did was unbelievable. Let me show you, this, this is what he had to do, work with. Putting a ceiling in here, putting, this is where the skylight was in the original train station. And this would be, they saved the, tr the skylight and had to refurbish that, restore, restore that, put lights in, but it's, but the, it's not natural sunlight that's coming down because that's so erratic, particularly in Pittsburgh. So what they did was put a light fixture underneath, behind, underneath that light. So you see that what well, looks like a skylight, but it's actually a variable lighting fixture that can vary the amount of light depending on the venue, whether they want bright light, dim light, sun, you know. So it's, it's a, a much better situation. But this is what they started with, just a picture of what it had looked like. There was nine feet of the actual, of the actual um, dental molding left, nine feet that he had to work with to make a, a rubber mold to be able to create additional dental molding around the perimeter. And you can see up here, there was the Greek key trim around, around the perimeter of the skylight. And he only had about 12 feet of that to be able to create, recreate that, make a mold to be able to create the plaster for that. And this is the masterpiece that this man was able to create. I mean, it was complicated, complex, but perfectly executed by this amazing man that had had 50 years of experience and passing it on to his son and grandson. And he had a, a team of a few other people that worked with him. Uh, this was called uh, Steel City Plastering, is his business uh, out in Cheswick. 
and they, they made these pieces and brought them back to the train station and would adhere them onto plywood and then put those on the wall in sections, three or four foot sections, and then each section would go on and then they would replaster where the pieces abutted each other. But there's another view of this amazing ceiling that he did. I have a question. Did he make a mold of the plaster to, to just reproduce it? To yes, he, he made a mold out of, I, um, I, the, he didn't, I don't think they actually had that. They had the piece, to, they took lots of detailed pictures, and I don't think that piece was intact enough to make that from that, but it might have been. He had nine feet to work with, but not much. But uh, they probably made a mold of that, and they and measured it with all the dimensions that they had, and then they made a, a perfect rubber mold of exactly what this thing, thing had started with, what they originally had. But you can see it was just beautiful what he ended up with. So then we, we have some pictures of um, what they, what before and after. The awfulness with this, the skylight there, which was not a skylight. That's just an open roof part. And what they ended up with. And, uh, and I show this terrazzo floor because the terrazzo floor, oftentimes terrazzo floors are just an inch thick or so. In the train station, when they built that in the first place, ours were three inches thick. So it, you'd think that it would have been really, really solid. And it, it was in most areas, but not all over. But they felt that if they, they got the right people in here from Allegheny Installations, and that company was an expert in terrazzo resp restoration and repair. So they were able to repair what needed to be repaired. I, I, my estimation was about 90% of it was able to be restored, and about 10% had to be completely redone. But they were the experts, and they knew how to mix the, the, the mixture that makes terrazzo into exactly the right color. And when I walked around there and nobody was there, I was looking because I had seen the damaged part before, and I couldn't, I couldn't find it again because that was so meticulous, the work that they did. But there's uh, another view of when the, during the work with all the amazing amount of the choreography of these different work, craftspeople working together and working apart as they went through this process. But that's what that, that section looked like. Here's another view. This is a clock, actually, which has not yet been brought back from the place it's restoring it. They had to send out a state to have that clock fixed. So we still have a hole in the wall where that goes. But you can see the, it's amazing what they were able to do. When you look at the beautiful terrazzo, the beautiful ceiling, the beautiful marble work, those are the three disciplines of craftsmanship that you can really appreciate what was done there. Uh, what do we have here? That's the skylight. That was the old skylight that it, it had to be replaced. And of course, you, like I said, it was now done with a, a fixture in there. But it looks just like the skylight because it's the restored original skylight except now it has variable lighting underneath it. Um, the light fixtures hang at the, in the middle of each side of that, just like they did in the original one. And you can see the Greek key theme around there, courtesy of the experts that knew how to make that mold. Again, the awful, this is the secondary lobby, the secondary room that they have there as you go through the main big one into the secondary one. And that's what that looks like today. There's another view of part of that room. Um, it took a while to get the windows because during COVID, a lot of things were just, in the, everything was on slow motion being, being created. This is that stairwell that went down to the, uh, the, the, the passenger's uh, tunnel, as they called it. But you would go down the steps and across, underneath the tracks to get to it. This is what, what that looked like before and after. So you can see this was not an easy restoration, but you can see from, from what people went through 100 years ago, why this was such an important building. So many people remembered bringing their grandpa there to catch the train or going there to meet their mom, to pick up their parents, uh, or getting on the train themselves to go for, whether it was pleasure or work. The train was a very important part, before and after. And this is the, sort of the south elevation of the building. Um, there's a courtyard down here there's a freight station. Yeah, this was where the baggage department was, but this is now a courtyard and they're going to be renting out the lower level for businesses. But then, da -da, September 24th, just six or eight weeks ago, six or seven weeks ago, they had the, the ribbon cutting ceremony. And here we are, this is the people cutting the ribbon um, that included the lady in the middle in the blue, in the blue suit. 
That is the executive director of the Wilkinsburg Community Development Corporation. That is Tracy Evans. And for her, um, she was the driving force behind all this. She was the one that said, this is a priority. This is what's going to be, this is what we're going to focus on. And they did. But alongside of her is the board president, Bernard Wetzel, the incoming board president, uh, Bud Wise, along with Bill Schenck, Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald, State Representative Ed Ganey, uh, Borough Council President Pamela Macklin, Mayor of Wilkinsburg, Marita Garrett, Leon Haynes, and others. It was, it was a wonderful day. And there's the people that afterwards, um, it was kind of a limited guest because of COVID, but they, they allowed people to come in and meander around seeing the, the amazing work. Uh, this is again, I love the terrazzo. <laughs> you can see I, I it was uh, hard to decide do I focus down for the terrazzo or up for the plaster because it was just awesome. Um, we like it better this way, filled with people, and that's the goal of the whole restoration is that soon it will, it will be hopefully a, a, a high end restaurant, is what we're looking for, because it will come with a, with a liquor license to enable that. Um, they had a plaque there acknowledging the significant donors and foundations who funded this restoration. Uh, these donors were amazing people because many of them stepped out in faith that if they gave their money that it would actually happen, something would come true, that it would really be restored. But they invested not just in the beauty of this building, but they invested in the future of Wilkinsburg. And we have, let's see, just they put some of these pictures showing the, the roof with no, <laughs> that the, didn't exist, uh, along with some pictures. They blew them up to have on display during that grand celebration. Here's a picture of my postcard <laughs> showing what it looked like 100 years ago and what it looks like still today now. This is another view of what it looks like from looking from the north side of the, of the building. Beautiful, restored, everything's perfect now. And this is the end of the program. This is it glows at night. It just glows. It's beautiful. It's beautiful night and day. And we're looking forward to now they're actively marketing that to be the... Uh, the next home for hopefully a high-end restaurant or possibly a venue for other activities. And the lower level of the building is, will be maybe maker spaces, businesses, offices, uh, not sure. But it's done, and it only recently got done with the ribbon cutting just September 24th. So, so I thank you for your attention to, uh, to my story, but you can see why it's, it's an important part of Wilkinsburg's rebirth. Uh, Wilkinsburg's been, um, sometimes it's, it's suffered from bad press and we're hoping that stories like this give it good press and that you can have a sense of why this was so important to us.